أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أستغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيد الأولين والآخرين شفي المزنبين رحمة للعالمين محمد وآله التيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذا هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب السلام عليكم يا brothers and sisters uh, first of all um, جزاك الله for giving me the very humble opportunity and honor of addressing you in these ten nights inshallah um, it's a privilege to be here and my niyat uh, really is inshallah for all of us to learn together and to purify ourselves learning from the message of Al Hussein alayhi salam and inshallah may Allah accept all of our efforts together um, I didn't want the title to be very long and you might curse me for that it's you know what am I trying to do here putting people off already um, but th I chose it purposefully because when we say the massacre of Karbala as an intellectual paradigm for Muslim scholarship which I'll explain I'm just trying in my very small way to look at Karbala from a different lens. Sometimes young people have discussions about it, about how we can contextualize Karbala today and make it relevant and all these things, which is true. And I want to take this line, but from a very intellectual route. So the lectures will be semi-academic. I'll try to combine intellectuality with spirituality as well. Now, when we say this word paradigm, what does it mean? Paradigm essentially means that there is some kind of standard or model or example that people follow at a given time. It might be a paradigm today that we have human rights. That's a paradigm for the world, that we're following human rights and we believe that it's a good thing. Thomas Kuhn, the famous um, historian, actually says that a paradigm represents uh, the achievements of a particular event or scholars, the achievements of scholars, which not only change people's minds, but they set a pattern for what is to follow. Okay? So that means, as an example of human rights, or this center, or you're doing the Salam Center, for example, maybe the Salam Center is a paradigm at the moment, or will be a paradigm as to maybe what center should be in the way that you're designing it, right? I'm just giving you an example. So then people would say, okay, if they accept, <laughs> yeah, people have to accept, first of all, that that is the appropriate way to build a center. If they accept that paradigm, then they'll follow it and say, right, for, future, for years to come, we believe that's how a mosque or a center should be designed. But how can you put Karbala here? Has Karbala ever been this kind of standard that we follow for things? Well, it's been a standard for the way we commemorate Karbala, yes. In the sense that the martyrdoms and uh, our rituals and martyrdom and crying and the majalis have become institutions, have become this kind of ideal and standard that if you look today, virtually every center will follow this. That you have to have the majalis and you have to have maktal and you have to have martyrdom. That becomes the pattern then to follow. Now, I'm not trying to remove that pattern at all, because ultimately you need to connect with what happened in Karbala. What I want to try to humbly do is to see, is there another lens which we can add to this pattern that we have created, which will allow the deeper messages and ethical messages of Karbala to come out? That's my question. Okay? And I especially mean it in 21st century Britain. Now these lectures are very much associated with British society. They can be applicable universally, but I don't like to say that because I think it's presumptuous of me to say that. But at least for the British society as we are attending here, we would like to know how this event and its messages are relevant on a day-to-day -day basis. And especially for scholarship, which comes to the latter part of the title. By scholarship I mean, if today you want to derive a law, you will use the science of usul al-fiqh and fiqh. If today you want to say, I want to reaffirm my faith or learn about my beliefs, you will use theology. Do you ever use Karbala in that sentence? I'm going to use Karbala to derive a law. 
I'm going to use Karbala to increase my faith. I'm going to use Karbala to understand, I don't know, human rights or ethics. Do we use Karbala as a science or as a particular lens by which we can practically move our ideas forward? And you have a few events in history which are remembered like that. You have in America the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s. And for those of you who have studied the movement, it's become a kind of pattern in which to embody human rights for African-American Muslims. And in fact, there were divisions within that civil rights movement. That's how much it is studied, and that's how much it influences African-American rights. Now, do we do that with Karbala? It's my humble contention that I don't think we do, and I think there's a lot of treasures in Karbala that has this impact. Then we come back to this word massacre. Why have I chosen massacre? Because often, as I'm sure you've heard, we say the tragedy of Karbala. We, most books that you read, even if you go on Wikipedia, it's usually described as a battle or tragedy. And as Kumail introduced, if you say tragedy, then the mindset is, this is just full of emotion, and it's all sad, and there's nothing really successful about Karbala. If you say battle, then it means, well, maybe Imam Hussain had some kind of large army, or there were some political aims, and these kind of things, and then you think it's about a war. And at the same time, the other, other two words are used, schism and fitna is also used to describe Karbala. Karbala was a schism that sealed the problems uh, in the, or, or gave birth to the problems in the Muslim community, and fitna, kind of discord and division. So these are the words used, and I'm not very comfortable with any of those words because I don't think it depicts what Karbala means. Karbala was essentially a massacre. It was a kind of outright killing, an outright butchery of a few people who believed in morals. Now today that's often known as kind of maybe genocide, or you say massacres around the world, and you say brutality, these are the words with, that we use. So we don't usually use these words to describe Karbala, although we use it in the maktal. So now we come to this kind of idea that if we say that Karbala is a massacre, then we are getting truthfully, or we are getting closer to what Karbala is. This kind of event where atrocities took place, where ideals and models and morals were present, and which has repercussions for every generation. Salawat. So perhaps we can begin that uh, before I give some suggestions of how we can construct a new paradigm which will be uh, taken bit by bit over the ten nights. Um, how is Karbala actually looked at, generally speaking? And I'll tackle the community, uh, academia, and media, just to give you some authentic representations of how we're looking at it. Well, in the community, and I don't want to delve too much because I think in some respects it's obvious, Karbala is essentially looked at as a tragedy, as a commemoration, where we are able to let out our emotions, and only our emotions, by the way, nothing to do much with our intellect, only our emotions, about the butcher of Imam Hussain And that is fine, that is there in a hadith, you go back to As-Saduq and you have many narrations about that. So yes, that is one level that we are accomplishing about Karbala. And then, alhamdulillah, that is fine because at least, I mean, we are human beings at the end of the day. We, we feel sympathy, we want to feel empathy and there's no problem in that. But in the community environment, we then, by only looking at it as a tragedy, we suppress the intellectual messages, the vision of Al Hussein, uh, his ideals, how it relates to contemporary movements, we don't really then talk about that too much. And if we do talk about that, we talk about it very generally. That is in essentially a, a, a community setting. And in fact, in fact, in academia, at least in Western academia, you will find s several books which talk about how Shia Muslims in particular commemorate Karbala. You won't find many books about how, about actually what Karbala stands for. And I'll, I'll give you some references for that. But scholars such as David Pinault and Peter Chelskowski and um, Kamran Scott Agihi and several others, they've written books all about the commemorations of Ashura. I have yet to found, find a book which talks about what Karbala is actually about. Okay? If you pick up a book, as I said, about civil rights movement in America or on Gandhi and these things, you'll actually find books about what, these, what he did and, and why he did certain things. There's only one book, 
um, called As-Sirat, Imam Hussein Conference, which some of you may remember, maybe some of the elders in this community attended it, I don't know. I think it was held in 1994, produced by the Muhammadi Trust. That's the only book I found, at least in English, which deals with the messages behind Karbala. That's the only book. So if you and I today want to explain to a non-Muslim what Karbala is about, or even we want to educate ourselves, I think we would be hard-pressed to find a valuable book on it. This is my small research that I found. Okay? And in fact, in Madrasa where I teach, I did ask the children, uh, you know, because Muharram is coming, so I said, you know, you're going to school and things, so how would you describe Karbala? And all of them gave the standard answer that the grandson of the Prophet was martyred and he saved Islam. Now obviously this is very alien language to a non-Muslim. Well, I don't believe in your Prophet, I don't believe in Islam. What is Islam? Now this is very strange because we know from the sermons of Imam Hussain al-Islam, which I will show throughout the lectures, he talked a lot about akhlaq, a lot. And the people that joined his movement, some of them were not even Muslims. Some of them were from other religions like Wahhab and Haniyyah and Qamar, they were Christians. You look at Hur, who was Hur? We, we, ce we celebrate, or rather commemorate Hur, but we celebrate Hur's uh, convert, not even necessary conversion, I don't know if that's a strong, maybe that's a strong word, but he moved into Imam Hussein's army, yet he just simply defined himself as a free man, his conscience was ignited, and he joined Imam Hussein's side. So this is all to do essentially with akhlaq, or some, somebody's inner motivation of finding God. So again, those kind of universal things are not always brought out. The other worrying thing, um, which actually I found out about a year and a half ago, there's a textbook which is now taught in some universities called Introducing Islam by William Shepard, published in 2009. And I read this book uh, because I had to do some tutorials for university. And this book is the standard kind of textbook that introduces what Islam is to people. There was about two or three, two pages, or one and a half pages on Karbala. And I want to read out to you how Yazid ibn Muawiyah is described in the book. Uh, William Shepard describes him. He says that some people say that Yazid was grossly dissolute and oppressive, though others describe him as skilled and capable. Skilled and capable. Now, when I read this, I just stopped because any person that's worth their salt, whether you are a scholar, whether you are a community member, 99% of Muslim historians and scholars, people like Ibn Kathir, would say that Yazid was basically an oppressive man, that he was a drunkard, that he was somebody that was a terrible man. He was not even regarded as a Muslim. So where are people getting information that Yazid is described as skill and capable? Now, there's only one conclusion I came to, which is within the realm of politics, even if you have bad morals, you can be described as skilled and capable. Maybe skilled in gathering an army, skilled in manipulating procedures, so you describe as skilled. But that depicts more about today's society than what morals actually are. Okay? But you can just see that if we don't intellectualize this event, if we don't do it, then other people are going to do it for us. And this is what's taught. Now, how many students, I mean, there were, I think, 90 students that enrolled in the class which I taught. That's 90 students. So you talk about every module, every semester and intake, every year, we're living in this country. So who is intellectualizing the tragedy? It's certainly not us, it's other people that are doing it and describing Yazid in this manner. Now, if there was evidence to support it, then fine, I wouldn't say anything. If there was evidence to support that fine, Yazid has some positive traits and there's no problem. But there isn't. So to me, it's a huge problem. And in fact, if in fact, Ibn Kathir in al bidaya wa Niha actually says, traditions inform us that Yazid loved worldly vices. Uh, he would drink, listen to music, kept the company of boys with no facial hair, played drums, kept dogs and made frogs, bears and monkeys fight. Every morning he used to be intoxicated and used to bind a monkey with a saddle of a horse and make the horse run. I mean, you're talking about a celebrated scholar from, at least from the Sunni sect, describing who Yazid is. And generally speaking, our Sunni brothers don't generally commemorate Karbala in the way that we do, in the sense make it a very big event. But even in their own scholarship, we find the same conclusions being brought about about Yazid. 
I'm just underscoring to you the problem that we are facing in our intellectual climate about how we are looking at Karbala and whether we are fulfilling the responsibilities to Al Hussein. Salwat, please. Now we come to the media. And I found this report four years ago. I had to give a lecture in Stanmore, actually, and I was doing some research for it. And I actually kept the quote intact, kept the reference intact, um, because it meant so much to me. Because when I was researching uh, the Majal, which I, which I had to give four years ago, which I remember vividly, the, remember, the reason it has stayed with me is because for, for one of the first times, I saw how the mass media and people in other countries were looking at us as Shia Muslims, the way we commemorate Karbala. Now, crying and uh, martyrdom and these things, these are noble institutions. I, I don't find this controversial at all, and I think these are normal institutions. World War I, World War II, commemorated by poppies and silences. The same thing, when we cry, when we are beating our chests, it's a sign of protest, a sign of emotion. There's no issue there as such. But the issue is, the issue is, when we engage in those rituals, perhaps like Zanjir, which I know there are different fatawa on, which do not use our energy in the best manner, one, and number two, detract from the message of Karbala. So when, when our own uh, commemorations take away from the words, and I'm really saying the words of Al-Hussein, then we have a problem. Because then Al-Hussein is not remembered for what he said to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, I'm doing this for Amr bil Ma'roof and Ali Munkar. That is the message which we have to extract. When that message becomes just suppressed or becomes quietened down, and other things are remembered which are in a way secondary things, then it means that Karbala in the wider context, in the wider humanity, is not recognized for its own qualities. And I want to read to you the report. This was dated 19 January 2008, and it was reported by BBC News. And in fact, it wasn't just a report, they put pictures of around the globe of how they saw Karbala, all right? And this is the captions, which I'll read. Shia Muslims around the world have been holding ceremonies to mark Ashura. Fine. The ceremonies mark the death in the battle of Imam Hussein, so we can pay close attention to the words. The ceremonies mark the death in battle of Imam Hussein, grandson of Prophet Muhammad, in the year 680. Here, picture, residents of Karbala in Iraq reenact the battle. His death at the hands of the Caliph Yazid was the defining moment that sealed the schism between Shia and Sunni Islam. Mm, I'm not sure about that because we're talking about Umayyads, not generally talking about Sunnis. And was it a schism? Ashura is a time of reflection and sorrow, which culminates over the weekend on the 10th day of the lunar month of Muharram. During remembrance ceremonies, Shias beat their heads and chests to echo the suffering of Imam Hussain. One ritual is the khara mali, or mud rubbing, in which devotees roll in mud, dry themselves by a fire, uh, and then flagellate themselves. Self-flagellation with chain whips is a common ritual. And in other ceremony, men cut their scalps with machetes in the city of Najaf. That's basically how, when we commemorate, that's what we are remembered for. And therefore, the paradox is, when we in our majalis say, everybody should remember Imam Hussein, everybody should look at Imam Hussein, well, the question is, what are we doing in order to intellectualize this tragedy? And is Hussein really universal anyway, if this is what we are depicting? And that, in my humble view, is the challenge that we have, not just in Britain, but around the world. So from all angles, Al Hussein's message is simply becoming buried and buried all the time. Now, the harder question is, uh, which maybe I've set myself too much of a task, which is, how can Karbala be this paradigm? How can Karbala be this standard, be this model for us to think, for us to use our intellects, for scholars also to use their intellects to move Karbala from this tragedy to a massacre and to a paradigm? There is a book which, by the grace of Allah, I had the opportunity to review. And it's called Islam and the English Enlightenment. It's published in 2011. It's written by Humberto Garcia. It's one of the few books in the field. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a book like it. 
It's called Islam and the English Enlightenment. Now, I'm sure some of you know the Enlightenment period in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries was the so-called period of especially European Enlightenment where scholars such as Kant uh, and even Kierkegaard and Rossio and others, um, even from uh, other parts of Europe, not just in Britain as well, they started to talk about rights. French Revolution, they start to talk about the welfare of society, the equality of men and women, the idea that a society should not just be monarchy and despotic, but should have parliament and will of the people. This is, I'm just giving you a brief summary, this is so-called enlightenment period, okay? Now what this guy does, which is really bold, he says, hold on a second, this enlightenment is regarded as a European phenomenon. So when we talk about human rights, we often say human rights was a European project and is a European project. He says, actually, Islam had enough contact with Europe in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries in order to influence discussions on rights, on welfare, on even religion, even religion in this country. And he doesn't just talk about it generally. He says that there was very big turmoil in this country. And I'll give you an example. This is what used to happen in this country during the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. Um, Disenfranchised nonconformists barred from holding public office. So if you were against Anglican Church or against the government, you were banned from holding public office. You were denied property rights. Women were uh, not allowed to own wealth and property under English common law. The Anglican state also banned Unitarians, Quakers, Catholics, and anti-Trinitarians, that is those people that did not believe in the Trinity, from holding public office and they were not allowed to obtain degrees from Oxford and Cambridge, okay? This is what the state was in the society. Now, uh, we uh, recently had a documentary um, on Channel 4, which some of you may have seen, where Tom Holland, the historian, uh, I, I looked, I analyzed it from an hour and 10 minutes. I wasn't gonna really look at it, and then I thought, okay, let me do it, you know, because sometimes it's documentaries, you don't learn much, but I learned a lot about the other side and what people are thinking. And he was trying to depict how basically Islam doesn't have a history. Makkah didn't really exist. Prophet may or may not have existed. Maybe Prophet, our peace, peace upon him, took the Islam from Christianity and Judaism. And he made a documentary about that. And the first thing that came to my mind was, how come we, as Muslims, don't research or don't think 50 to 100 years ahead and look at this piece of history and see what we contributed to society and what we contributed to civilization, which I'm going to come to. That's why I mentioned this. This was the state of this country, okay? Now, what does Humberto Garcia do? Every Muharram, we use quotes from people, don't we? Thomas Carlyle, Henry Stubb, Mahatma Gandhi, Edward Gibbon, and we say that look how universal Karbala is. Now, obviously, that's fine, but nobody really follows those quotes outside of what we say. Most people don't really know what Karbala is. Um, I went to uh, a conference three years ago in uh, Scotland, okay? And my uh, paper was called Al Hussein, the Human Conscience. The conference was about revolutions of humanity. So I said, look, I'm going to present about Imam Hussein al-Islam. And I'm talking about a conference that was full of postgraduates and a few top professors and educated professors. And I gave this presentation. Nobody had heard about Karbala, nobody. So when we use these quotes... First of all, we have to take stock. Does anybody know about Karbala outside our own community centers? And when I actually read the Maktal in the university seminar when I was presenting the paper, just to give a flavor of, um, of what the event had happened and how Hussein had, had actually been martyred. And you won't believe this. The professor who I'm still in touch with, he's a really great professor, he ha his, water, his eyes were watering. His eyes were watering when he heard how Hussein al-Islam died. That's the impact. That's the impact of this massacre. But obviously I contextualize it to make it relevant in the 21st century. Now the reason I'm telling you all this is because when Humberto Garcia mentions this, he quotes the very people that we quote every Muharram as saying, you know, Thomas Carlyle and Henry Stubb, and we say, look how they looked at Hussein. My question is this. Why did these English people, British people, actually bother to look at Islam, to look at the Prophet, and to look at Imam Hussein? Do we ever ask ourselves this question? Why did they actually look at the Qur'an? 
You know, they were actually writing manuscripts about the biography of the Prophet, where they actually mentioned Imam salam in very early history. In today's, uh, if, you f- if you pick up most history books about Islam, Imam Ali is hardly mentioned, hardly. I'm talking about at least in English literature. But they actually saw that Imam Ali was a heroic person, a courageous person, and they mentioned Lady Fatima alayhi salam. That means sometimes when you are not inside the faith and you look at it from outside, you're sometimes able to look at it a bit more objectively. That's what I saw in them. That they're able to actually recognize that after the Prophet, you had this man, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who had these great noble traits, and he was the person that started to carry on the message of Islam. That's how they saw history. And I actually have excerpts of the manuscript, and it's there in the book. Now what he says, he says these people, the reason why they took interest is because in their own society, women were denied rights. And you had an Anglican church that was consuming society. That the government was being unfair. So they started to open the Quran. They started to look at some history books. You know what they said? They said that this Muhammad, who, used to, who they used to call Mahomet, this Mahomet was a prophet and priest, they used to say. And this prophet and priest actually taught the idolatrous Christians and Jews lessons. And he gave rights to people. And you know what they termed Islam? They didn't say Islam. They said that there was such a thing that the Prophet did in Makkah and Medina called Islamic Republicanism. That's how they contextualized the message of the Prophet. Because when you talk about a republic, you're saying that basically there's a people's voice in society. People are basically leading society. That's the concept of a republic. So look at what they did. They started to translate Islam as Islamic Republicanism and they started to write poems. They even started to say these things in British courts. They even started to write these things and develop manuscripts. And they used to give speeches about these things. Now, most of them were not actually published. They were published posthumously after they passed away. That's why we have them. They were not published in their own time. And you can imagine why. Why would an Anglican church be interested in Islam? Even today, if you want to publish certain things, a publisher has a certain interest. Government has certain self-interest. It's difficult. So when we quote these scholars, the reason they took interest and the cleverness of them, they extracted the fundamental messages of the Prophet, which was embodied in Sahifatul Medina, the Charter of Medina, where he gave rights to Christians and Jews, where, where Islam was fundamentally about welfare, about upliftment, about not seeing an orphan on the street. When they saw this, they, just, they were marveled. Who is this person that can do this? This is how they looked at the Prophet. And let me quote you as proof. This is Samuel Taylor Coleridge. This is his poem, Mahomet, of 1799. He says, Utter the song, O my soul, the flight and return of Muhammad. He wants to see Muhammad in his own society. Prophet and priest, who scattered abroad both evil and blessing, huge, wasteful empires, founded and hallowed slow persecution. This man, the Prophet, Within 23 years, Islam was a force. He then he says, Soul withering, but crushed the blasphemous rights of the pagans and idolatrous Christians, for veiling the gospel of Jesus. That means he's saying that the Christians within the Prophet's time, at least some of them, had covered the original message of Prophet Isa a.s. They, the best corrupting, had made it worse than the vilest. There, where, uh, wherefore heaven decreed the enthusiast warrior of Makkah, choosing good from iniquity rather than evil from goodness. This is only the first part of the poem. Look how he's looking at the prophet. Look how he's composing the poetry. How he's extracting both the religious, the moral, the spiritual messages, the vision of the prophet. And therefore, what Humberto Garcia's conclusion is, that Islam played a role in giving rights to people. Because if Islam wasn't there, these elitist British people, who were the forerunners in some respects of the British Enlightenment, they used parts of Islam in their deliberations. And my question to you, my dear brothers and sisters is, who knows about this, number one? Do we research this? Do we think 100 years ahead that we should make a documentary about this? That we use our three channels, which is full of majalises, 
that instead we should use it for wonderful documentaries that can make people think. This is our fundamental challenge, and are we meeting this challenge? In my humble research, I don't think we are, and I don't think we should be content either in just simply commemorating Hussein in the way that we do. And Humberto Garcia's ch uh, challenge at the end of the book, he says that if, and this is his conclusion, that if Islam had a contribution to make in the English Enlightenment, that the Enlightenment was not European. That when we say this term modern, it's not European. And not only that, today when Islam is looked at as the clash of civilizations and a terrorist religion, it tells us that rather Islam was much more a rights-based religion than the other religions of its time. And he challenges people, both the Enlightenments, both secularists, both of other religions, to take his proposal forward. Salwat. I'm just giving you um, an idea, actually, of how we can actually construct this paradigm by recontextualizing it within our society. Now, I want to give you, this is the final bit now, because I should never just pose a question and leave it, because, OK, I've, I've translated it within British society, but how can it be done? I'm going to just take the hadith of the eighth Imam, alayhi salam, um, and we usually use this hadith when we do gambayan or maktal. Usually, it's the very famous hadith to Ibn Shabib, uh, quoted in Uyun al Akbar Rida, compiled by As Saduq. And this is the question I'm posing to you. How can we use our ahadith or our maktals or the way we're looking at Karbala and do what Humberto Garcia is trying to do or what the, the great philosophers and poets did in the 16th, 17th, 18th century? How do we translate this message of Karbala in our modern language? One of our key pieces of language today is human rights. Apparently, everybody today has rights, apparently. Po and that's both, uh, both a positive and negative thing, by the way. We shall come on to tomorrow and day after. And the reason I say negative, one, is because not everybody has rights. And we, when we want to reform sometimes usul al-fiqh, or when we want to say there's a problem with Western rights, again, there's huge problems in these approaches because we're assuming that human rights is a basis for reform. And I want to question that, actually. But nonetheless, it is a discourse for us. We say, this is my right of free speech. This is my right of privacy. You can't enter my home. I have a right not to be tortured. Everybody, even any Tom, Dick, and Harry speaks about rights. This is our language today. This is what most of the children in school will be taught. Look at the hadith of the eighth imam, and this is just my humble attempt of contextualizing it, OK? He says, Ya ibn shabib or ibn shabib in kunta baqi an li shay'in. If you want to cry for a thing, فَأَبْكِلِ الْحُسَيْنِ ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib Then cry for Hussein, son of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. فَإِنَّهُ ذُبِحَا كَمَا يُذْبَحُ الْكَبْشِ And we use this line a lot. Indeed, he was slaughtered like a sheep is slaughtered. Yes, it is very emotional. Yes. Hussein was slaughtered like a sheep is slaughtered. That is an example of butchery. Okay. وَقُتِلَ مَعَهُ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ and he was killed along with 18 members of his household. There is none like them on the earth. We're elevating them, of course. That indeed the seven uh, uh, heavens and the earth cried upon his martyrdom. Okay? The narrations continue that the angels did descend to help Hussein salam, but he was destined to be martyred, and the angels will remain at the qabr of al Hussein salam until Al-Qaim al-Mahdi salam will rise. Salawat, please. Allahumma salli ala. And their slogan, their slogan will be, Ya la thadat al O revenge for Hussein. Okay, this is a very famous hadith. Now, how is this possibly relevant? How is this relevant in today's society? How is this relevant to non-Muslim? How is this relevant to us? If you contextualize this hadith in human rights language, what do you find? And I made a small table of this, actually. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, famous Universal Declaration, which uh, was constructed after World War II, was constructed, why? Because in the preamble, it says, that the conscience of mankind was outraged by the atrocities that it saw during the world wars. 
So they constructed rights. Okay, countries started to construct a charter. What happened in Karbala? Article 2 of the UDHR guarantees the right to life, liberty and security of the person. The massacre of Al Hussein, his family, the children and his companions means they were denied the right to life. Article 5 prohibits torture, cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. The women were tortured and the children were tortured. Article 18 guarantees the right of freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Al Hussein was not allowed to express his own moral views or his own religious views about what a true religion is. Article 20 guarantees the right of freedom of peaceful assembly and association and no one may be compelled to belong to an association. When Al Hussein -Islam, tried to gather people and spread his message even to Kufa, what happens? His own companions were beheaded. Article, Article 10 states, everyone is entitled to a full and fair public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal. Al Hussein was never given a trial. If we are to translate the message of Al Hussein, it means going back to our hadith, recontextualizing them, and looking at them in the language that we are speaking about today. Because no human being would look at this, tri would look at this massacre sorry, and say that Al Hussein had any sort of rights. He had no rights. But if we speak about it like that, and we write about it like that, and we make documentaries about it like that, then people will start to take note. And then we would be truly contextualizing this message of Al Hussein al Islam, inshallah. Salawat, please. These are just uh, really the starting thoughts of the 10 lectures. And I want to unravel the massacre of Karbala, inshallah. But I hope. Um, that I've given us some food to think about. I'm really doing this from my heart. I'm not doing this, you know, to ruffle feathers and say something different. It's, it's what I believe. It's how me, as a person, has grown up in this society. How Karbala, what Karbala has meant to me and what it has not meant to me. Really, I'm telling you this. I'm not saying these things only because this is just the great and modern thing to do. I really believe nobody knows about Hussein, and I believe we should give him more credit. And I think we are the only people, as people that grow up in the Shia faith, that have the responsibility and understanding to the, inshallah. Make um, the, 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 the massacre of Imam Hussein salam relevant to our language uh, in this society, in this time. Um, we need to have some kind of strategy as to how that's actually delivered. In your view, what do we do first? Do we first bring out the, the intellectual argument or do we bring out the emotional argument? And now, as you probably know, there are a couple of very interesting initiatives that are happening this particular Muharram with the Who is Hussein campaign mm -hmm. and also the release of um, a book which actually um, uh, has every single um, sermon of, of, of the grandson of the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, uh, um, uh, translated into English. Should we be starting there or should we be creating the intellectual argument first? I just love the question. Um, honestly, I say that there's no reason that we can't do both. I think we should retain the institution um, of the majalis and of the crying, and I don't think there's any reason to stop that, really. And I think that's, that gives us sometimes the inspiration and the connection. But alongside that, and maybe it is a responsibility of scholars, really, to think more about some of the themes which are discussed in the lecture. And I think that is a responsibility of intellectuals, of community members that want to do this as well. I'm uh, aware of the initiatives, which Alhamdulillah, I think are really great initiatives. But they are also at the level, at, at the first level of, ex first of all, expressing the message in modern society. The level which I'm talking about, obviously, is that, you know, Karbala becomes this kind of universal event. And there are literature, and there is scores of books, and it's studied. You know, and that's the pinnacle, I think, that that's what Karbala should be. But I, I, I sort of, in a way, bo both, both strands should be pursued. And I think, really, it's people who are involved in the scholarship should take the responsibility for one section. People in the community should take responsibility for the other section. Any more questions? Um, 
Is there an assumption here? But thank you very much Definitely. again for your talk because I think it's raised quite a few interesting points. One of the, the one of the assumptions I think we're making here is, or should I ask the question? Do you think we have consensus within the Shia community about what Karbala means to us before we can actually project that to the wider community? Um, Zakallah, um, yes and no. Um, I think yes, we do have a consensus that Karbala should be just about commemoration. I think that's the public consensus and even generally the scholarly consensus. But there's no halal and haram. That's just, as I said, a paradigm. Uh, when I said that Thomas Kuhn said that a paradigm is something that sets a pattern. He also said that the paradigm is actually something that um, can harm itself because when you are within a paradigm, you feel comfortable and the paradigm stops from other new ideas and new frameworks from forming. And I think we are stuck in that paradigm. So I think the consensus is that. But as you all know, uh, scholarly consensus changes from time to time. And I think maybe it is time for that consensus to widen or change. Um, so yes, we have a consensus. But I also feel there's no reason why individuals cannot project ideas and views. And certainly in the history of Shi or Muslim scholarship, you may have Mirza Shirazi in Samarra that did arguably the first fatwa on a political fatwa about the tobacco protest uh, movement. And that was a huge thing at the time. But he changed the conception of what a marja should be. So again, I don't see that as, a, as an obstacle as such, personally. Thank you very much. Um, inshallah, I will um, deal with Hani ibn Urwa because we're starting off with Karbala, the journey, and some of the initial companions that helped al Hussein alayhi salam. Hani ibn Urwa was quite an old man when he was martyred. And it is reported that he was one of the older companions who also kind of saw the, the Prophet's time as well. And our dear Hani gave residence and gave a house to Muslim ibn Aqil. And we know that Muslim ibn Aqil, a staunch companion of al Hussein was eventually beheaded. But it was Hani who actually gave him that safe journey, that safe passage, and allowed him to stay at his house. However, when Ibn Ziyad found out what this poor old man was doing, he started to order that this man should be beheaded. What kind of mercy is this? What kind of mercy did Yazid have on these people? All these people were trying to do was to protect morality. When Ibn Ziyad told Hani that prepare yourself for the execution, get ready, Hani refused. He said, I refuse to prepare my body to be executed. I refuse to put on anything and get rid of anything. Because why should I prepare myself for a bad deed? Ibn Ziyad had no mercy. And it is reported that Hani was dragged in the streets of Kufa and simply executed there. He said, Hani said before his death, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Do we have this courage to stand up for akhlaq today? The akhlaq of society, the akhlaq of our religion and the akhlaq of our family. What would happen to us if we had to give safe passage to somebody? Poems were composed about this incident, and Sheikh Mufid quotes this poem saying, If you do not know what death is, look at Hani and Ibn Aqil in the marketplace. Look at a hero whose face the sword has covered with wounds, and at another who fell dead from a high place, and who was that person? Muslim Aqil. The command of the governor struck them down. And they became legends for those who travel on every road. You see a corpse whose color death has changed and a spattering of blood which has flown abundantly. What did this old man do? This old man did nothing but stand up for the message of Al Hussein. May Allah elevate his stations and may we learn from him. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Oh,